Hello everybody, it's Rachel from North Brisbane Psychologists joining you live this afternoon on my own without Alexis because she is in Victoria and I'm still in Brisbane. So I thought that I would jump on anyway and talk about a topic that's very general and very relevant in both life and in psychotherapy. And that is the issue of acceptance versus avoidance. So I'll just say a few things about um, this issue of acceptance and the opposite of acceptance in psychology, which is avoidance. I'll say a few things about that. And then I would like to open it up to any questions, any comments. You've got me all to yourself today. Um, and I can hang around. I've got dinner in the oven. I can hang around for half an hour until that's ready. And... Um, yeah, I'll be interested to hear your questions um, about any topic whatsoever. But let me start on this topic of acceptance uh, because, you know, in many therapies, um, and in fact, in, in almost every therapy, I think it's fair to say that cultivating the ability to observe one's self and accept one's inner experience. So the kind of automatic and intrusive thoughts that we all get from time to time, the, uh, the, the difficult feelings, the uncomfortable feelings, and, and on a physical sensation level, pain and tension. So we've got those three levels of private experience, cognitive, our thoughts uh, and beliefs, uh, emotional, our feelings, uh, you know, enjoyable and less, less enjoyable, and physical sensations and tensions. Um, and human beings will go to great lengths to um, ignore and avoid uh, uncomfortable, unwanted thoughts, uncomfortable, unwanted feelings, and uncomfortable and unwanted physical sensations. We all know this when we've been in pain and our mind has kicked in, you know. I hate this, I don't want this, I can't do this. And so I, um, you know, I, I consider the opposite of, of acceptance to be avoidance. And the mind is very good at avoiding. And it's, it's a survival response. It's kind of like our flight response. We want to move away from pain and discomfort. It's a basic tenet, psychology 101. Humans are motivated to move away from pain and discomfort and towards um, reward and pleasure. Very basic. If we just step right back, we can see how so much of our behavior is that. Except when it's not, of course, and we can talk about that. But um, I'm just going to open up the comments here uh, on my laptop. I'm talking to you on my phone. And uh, that way I can monitor those comments. There's a great article on psychology today um, posted a few weeks ago called psychological pain, or oh, the most important question in therapy, psychological pain arises from attempts at avoidance. <clears throat> and I guess this is where I want to start, because our attempts at pain avoidance actually create our bad habits. Uh, so a question that we could ask in therapy of all our clients, potentially, if they're talking about um, thought patterns that are intrusive and unwanted, if they're talking about habits, addictions, is we could ask the question, what are you avoiding? You know, if you, uh, we all have habits. I, um, I used to bite my nails and I don't anymore because I get them to do my nails at the salon, um, which was just an interesting, strange little psychological experience in itself to kind of notice what maybe I was avoiding or kind of trying to soothe in myself. And that was anxiety. Some of us eat, drink, smoke, scroll Facebook. And if you're doing that right now to dissociate and um, avoid your discomfort, maybe close down this tab and, and meditate or something. So um, there's, you know, there's great questions we can ask in therapy. But one of them is, what does this current behavior that you're trying to change allow you to avoid? So I'll ask that again because it's such a powerful question. Think of a behavior that you um, want to change, that you don't want to continue for the rest of your life, 
and gently ask yourself, what does this current behavior allow you to avoid? And that is your secondary gain right there. And forgive yourself because all of us want to avoid pain. All of us want to avoid anxiety or feeling sad and having to grieve. Um, there's many feelings that we would like to avoid. And it's funny the different ways we avoid. Uh, a strange, let me talk about one in particular, a strange way that we avoid pain is through worry and overthinking. So please give me a thumbs up in the comments if you relate to um, being a bit of a worrier or an overthinker. I should give myself a thumbs up for that, I reckon. I'll do that right now. <laughs> um, give me a thumbs up if you are a worrier or an overthinker because uh, this is very, very normal for humans, very habitual. And worry is kind of avoidance masquerading as action. I'll say that again. Worry is avoidance masquerading as action. Uh, it's as if worry is very seductive. <laughs> Mia says warrior and overthinker. Two out of two. Uh, you wouldn't be the only one, Mia. Yeah, I relate to that as well. But I did realize about 10 years ago, and it was a bit of an epiphany, that worry and overthinking is so seductive because it feels as if we're doing something. And it's like, if I just worry about this enough and think about it long enough, I'll figure it out. I'll figure out the answer. And when you look back over your life, you can see that worry and rumination, which is stewing and dwelling on on something, particularly the past, uh, probably never helped you, was probably never productive, and therefore is quite unnecessary, and yet we do it. And it is seductive because it feels like we're taking action or working on the problem, even though we're not. So, um, you know, that worry, bizarrely, is, is an avoidance tactic. It can actually uh, cover up the fact that we're feeling vulnerable, sad, uncomfortable. But once we identify the ineffective behavior, even the internal behavior of worry, then we can discover inside of ourselves some feelings we've been avoiding uh, and take the next action, which is to say, um, you know, because often we're believing that we can't tolerate the sadness or we can't tolerate the feeling of fear or we can't tolerate the disappointment or the hurt. But what if we turned that around and said, I can tolerate it. I don't have to like it, but I can tolerate hurt. I can tolerate confusion or disappointment or sadness or nervousness. Like you can tolerate those feelings. You know that you can because you have before. Um, and when we change the intolerable to tolerable, we can actually, you know, this, excuse my French, but sit in the shit. You know, we can actually sit in our vulnerability, go through it, feel it, and then it starts to um, evaporate by itself. It takes care of itself. I'll just finish with one quote before I read the comments. Miles Davis, who's a famous blues um, jazz musician from many decades ago, you've probably heard of him. I heard a quote from him the other day. He said, we play the blues to get rid of the blues. And and if that was true for him, at least, I, I, I understand what he's saying. You know, we, we want to um, sit with our feelings and honor them in some way or express them in some way that's not destructive or avoidant. And, you know, he, he played the blues to um, get rid of the blues. So sometimes we have to experience our feelings is how I interpret that rather than avoid them. Now let me see if there's any comments here um, because I'm here alone without Alexis and I'm really just here to talk to you about this very broad topic of acceptance versus avoidance and anything else that you might want to ask me about. So let's see. So Stephanie says, I avoid out of judgment of others. So Stephanie, I'm wondering what you mean I avoid out of judgment of others. So yes, I think I do know what you mean. When we judge others, it's a way of avoiding feeling the primary feeling. So I think I know what you mean from my own life. If I feel hurt, 
instead of just letting myself, my poor animal heart, my poor childlike heart, just kind of go into the hurt and, and the sadness of that, you know, I go up into my head and I judge others. And that's an avoidance of acknowledging the pain. So I, I get what you mean. Darren says, great, now I'm overthinking. Can I overthink about overthinking? You, I know you're half joking, Jaron, because you like to make funny comments on these videos. I remember now. Please don't overthink about overthinking. Mia says, this is a really important point, especially when you work in therapy. Yes, there's a lot of this going on around my clinic at the moment. We avoid every day. And I want to say one other thing, you know, there's tactical avoidance, which Freud called suppression. And we all do it spontaneously. Um... It's different to repression, which is more of an unconscious mechanism. But when we're kind of aware that we're pushing down a feeling, because maybe we have to get through the day, get the kids to school, go to that meeting, we've got a function. You know, if we can put the feeling on hold and um, come back to it later somehow, if we remember to come back to it later and process it and talk about it or meditate with it or journal about it or somehow get in touch with it, then um, that's that's. A very functional approach you know that's very healthy I think the problem is that we suppress feelings because we have to get on with our day and function and then we don't come back and process them and sometimes feelings can come up that have been there for days weeks months or years so um, yeah I would say that all of us all of us avoid uh, that we can't not avoid you know because there's so much that goes on in our lives and we can't process it all at once at the time that it's happening um, we do our best to accept, um, and there's no perfection here. But I just want to normalize avoidance. Wendy says, I avoid people because I crave love and worry, and I don't deserve it. So I avoid everyone not to suffer rejection. Oh, Wendy, my heart goes out to you. This is such a common thing, actually, because um, to open ourselves up, even just to send somebody a text message and say, you know, I'm thinking of you, or would you like to catch up for lunch or a coffee is a vulnerable thing to do um, sometimes because we do risk rejection. Um, that's why people get social anxiety because, you know, going to a party or a work meeting or speaking in public, it, it's, it feels like such a risk of rejection. But I'm glad you shared that, Wendy, because one, there's many things I could say, but one of the things I've learned is that uh, I call it taking people backstage. Uh, I gave a talk to a bunch of doctors the other day and they, um, I was halfway through my talk on managing stress and I was talking about naming feelings and I said to these very educated doctors, I said, and right now I'm noticing that I'm telling myself that these doctors are getting very bored with you, Rachel. Um, and you know what? <laughs> so I basically told people I was feeling nervous in the middle, not at the start. Sometimes I tell people right at the start of something, you know, this is how I'm feeling. I'm feeling a bit tired. I'm feeling nervous. But I told them halfway through that I was feeling nervous then, that I noticed my thoughts. I wasn't avoiding my thoughts. I just, I, I spoke them. I said, I'm, I'm starting to tell myself that um, maybe you're getting bored. And of course, I don't know if you are. And I can feel my heart racing. I can feel some tightness in my jaw. So I'm just going to breathe and feel my feet. And in real time, I was modeling for them. Um, acceptance of what was that's true for me in that moment that was happening um, and and this is this is this takes you know it's slow work it takes practice and it's iterative like you never get really great at acceptance acceptance is a process acceptance of ourselves and all that comes up inside us even the bits we don't like all the fears all the anxieties the ironic and paradoxical thing is the more that you accept yourself and everything that's in you the more able you are to work with it and change it. But the more you resist it and reject it, the anxieties, the fears, the shame, the the shadow stuff, the tendencies to, you know, do things that are not helpful, the destructive behaviors that we all have the tendency towards at times, if we can accept all of that inner content, paradoxically, it actually becomes much easier to work with. It's like facing your fears, right? Then you can actually look at them, work with them. And if you can, you know, sit with them long enough, you can contemplate how to make changes and you can make changes. But rejecting things inside yourself only pushes it into the shadows or makes an enemy out of it. And then you're at war within yourself 
and it's never it's never a great idea to be at war within yourself. Let's see what the comments say now. Um, oh, Tracy says she's got sound issues. Tracy, let us know if the sound has come back. Uh, I'll turn up the volume. I don't know if that'll make a difference. Um, Erica says, same, so you relate to what I'm saying. Um, or maybe you have sound issues, I'm not sure. Um, Mia says, you speak about journaling and meditating as ways to turn into how we're feeling and identifying, but generally avoidance is an ingrained and learned behavior. Most people may not understand or realize. What would be something you'd advise for people to learn and work on this learned behavior if they don't have access to therapy so they can still make some progress? That's a really good question, Mia. Um, so I agree with you. You can, you can meditate or do journaling or do yoga or even go to therapy and still be avoiding your feelings. In fact, sometimes I know when my clients are avoiding their feelings or when I'm avoiding my feelings because all that comes out is the story, the storyline, the storyline. Um, meditation practices, uh, and there are some great, um, I use the Insight Timer app for meditation and I just use the the bells and the background sound just to keep track of time. But there's some wonderful guided meditations on the Insight Timer app that are about tuning in with your feelings. Doing a body scan can be one way because our feelings are in our body. So, you know, often our feelings are originally in our torso, in our chest, solar plexus, gut, because this is how our vagus nerve wraps itself through our body around our heart, lungs and digestive system. But if we um, ignore them uh, there, then before too long, they may end up in uh, the muscles, tension, tension often for people in the shoulders and neck, tension in the jaw or head. Very often it's upper body, but everybody's different. Some of my clients um, it seems to stay in their torso and they might have panic attacks or it stays in their torso, but they have digestive issues. Um, I've had other clients tell me they store their feelings if they don't process them quick enough. They store them in their, in their hip muscles and joints. So, I, I mean, I don't know enough about um, that to comment, but I think body work is a good place to start, Mia, with meditation, um, approaches that are not about spiritual dissociation, zoning out, um, you know, going out of our bodies, but actually going into our bodies and reading books. Um, there's some great self-help books. Maybe people could suggest comments uh, in the comments, some books that you've read that have actually helped you get in touch with your feelings. Even when I read Daniel Goldman's Emotional Intelligence, it's very academic, but there were sections in there which really helped me understand and feel my feelings. And then I would also add, finally, music. I think music is a great way to get in touch with feelings. Um, I have an emotional playlist on my Spotify so that I can choose songs that I know are likely to get me into my feelings. Ah, the vagus nerve conversation, says Mia. More of that. Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, I can say some more about the vagus nerve if people are interested. Let me just check the comments here. Um, because, uh, I've never done it this way before and, um, yeah, I think I'm losing some comments. Oh, no, here we go. So more about the vagus nerve. Uh, well, the vagus nerve is, um, a major part of our autonomic nervous system. It runs from the back of the brain down into the throat area, wraps itself around the heart and the lungs and the digestive system. And it's responsible for sending messages from the viscera. So the viscera are, you know, the organs, uh, the major organs, back to the brain and vice versa. So our brain sends messages to our heart, lungs and gut and um, through the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve transfers them back again. So it's very implicated in our mental health, in our well-being, in our emotions. And you can Google, you know, improve vagal tone or how to... Um, care for your vagus nerve in, you know, in your own time. There's so many great articles now. Uh, music is one good way. Meditation and yoga are good ways. So some of the things I've already mentioned. And um, the other thing I like to do, this is a little weird one, 
is I like to visualize my nervous system and uh, I'll show you my favorite image of, I'll put it in the comments, my favorite image of the vagus nerve because it's just so beautiful. Um, and with the image of my vagus nerve, or just of my, I've got a picture of my nervous, I might take you out in a second, show you the picture that's right outside my bedroom door of the nervous system. Because when I visualize my nervous system, I can sort of have compassion for my nervous system. That might sound weird. I don't know if that sounds weird to you. But uh, I like to have images as anchors. And this image, let me put it in the comments now, see if it works. Um is, <laughs> I don't know if it's working. Let me try again. I put it in a PowerPoint slide. I did a talk recently for um, some accountants. They were more fun than I expected, actually, those accountants. <laughs> and they, um, yeah, they, they, it was on bur managing burnout, which is an area of interest for me. I can't get it to work. Um, I'll keep trying and I'll keep checking the comments. I do the same thing, Rachel. It's not weird at all, says Mia. Yeah. You know, I think we can't actually see our lungs, our heart, our brain, our nervous system, uh, and all the things that, you know, are affected by and in turn affect emotions and all the things that keep us alive. We can't see it. So I think we have to visualize it um, because, you know, we like to look at our pets, for example. We like to look at our cat and our dog and there's something about, or our, our loved ones, something about looking at a person or a tree, you know, and we kind of feel for that object or that person or that being. Ah, uh, here we go. I found the image that I love. It's obviously an artist's impression and this is an article called 10 Vegas Nerve Hacks. And it's the image of the golden nervous system that I love. I've just put it in the comments. Um, so yes, that's my little visual. I visualize my poor little nervous system and I say, poor little nervous system, it's okay. <laughs> you know, I'll, um, I'll look after you. And it could be everything from a hot shower to a walk to a call with a friend that I just keep that image in my mind of the nervous system. So I'm just going to open this up to comments now. We've covered acceptance, we've covered avoidance, talked a bit about the vagus nerve. You've got me here if you're listening to ask me anything. Think of it like a Reddit AKA, not AKA, <laughs> AMA. Ask me anything um, because I'm happy to... Um, Talk about whatever questions you've got me for free. Um, so pop your questions in the comments. Um, Alexis is away today. She's out of town, traveling around Victoria for um, work and personal um, travel and looking at a retreat center down in Victoria that she and I might use to do our yoga and psychology retreats. But if there's no questions, um, let me just refresh this, then uh, I can just talk about those retreats and, you know, sign off. And um, yeah, I might post in the comments uh, some links to my um, burnout talks and the retreat in November. Oh, here we go. There's a comment from Mia. How can we learn about burnout? The stuff I've Googled isn't great. And Jaren says, how do you define overthinking as opposed to other forms of thinking? Great. Thank you for those two questions. So Mia, I, my burnout, uh, my PhD was on burnout and I used Christina Maslach's definition. And let me give you what I think are the four components of, of burnout. Um, certainly job burnout or carer burnout. Um, this is what I talk with my doctors about. Emotional exhaustion is the first one. And emotional exhaustion comes from the work of regulating your own emotions while you're also regulating other emotions. So helping professionals are at most risk because of course, doctors, teachers, carers, disability workers, social workers, nurses, uh, and so forth. We're often um, trying to manage how we're feeling so we can do our job in the face of stress and then manage how, you know, the students are going or the clients or the patients, you know, they can get dysregulated. So you're regulating yourself, you're helping them regulate and that's fatiguing. Uh, and this is emotional exhaustion. 
The second component is called diminished personal accomplishment and that's just when you lose the love and start to get a bit cynical and don't enjoy your job as, as much as you once did. So diminished accomplishment. The third component is depersonalization. So you start to get annoyed with clients or patients instead of um, loving them. So they come, become objects who almost get in the way of you doing your job even though they are your job. Um, so being a bit callous and treating patients or clients as objects. So they're the three traditional components of burnout. But recently they've identified a fourth component of burnout, which is loneliness. Because um, if we feel lonely, we're much more likely to be um, to experience a degree of burnout. Uh, people who work in teams, I work with architects at the moment doing some leadership training and they work very long hours on very big projects, but I haven't seen them burn out because they work collaboratively in teams. And they even uh, do do some emotional labor because they get abused sometimes by um, building and construction companies uh, and their clients. But um, yeah, it's not just long hours. It's not just working long hours. It's feeling lonely in your work, which is the fourth component of burnout. Um, I hope that helps. I can, if you want to send me your email in the, um, in the chat, Mia, I can send you a bunch of resources on burnout that I share with people. Um, so do that later. Uh, oh, lots of questions coming through. Jaron, how do you define overthinking as opposed to other forms of thinking? I think um, overthinking happens on autopilot. Jaron, if you Google default mode network, default mode network is um, the part of our brain which is, you know, just the autopilot. When we're, you know, not controlling our thinking, it takes control. And it sometimes it's just daydreaming. But sometimes it turns into worry and rumination. So overthinking is worry and rumination and automatic thinking and intrusive thinking, which can be reasonably neutral and whatever, but it can easily kind of like a car that you've let go of the steering wheel. It can kind of end up going into the gutter of worry and rumination. And then we're in the overthinking territory. And the other type of thinking I would call deliberate or intentional thinking. This can be writing a shopping list, sitting down to do a tax return, or the traditional CBT technique of like, okay, stop and see where I am. Pause, take a breath, find three things that are red and four things that start with the letter S. Um, play little mental games with yourself. Any form of thinking that's intentional and deliberate gets you out of that default mode. And so in a way, there's only two types of thinking. Automatic thinking, the default mode, and um deliberate intentional thinking, which they call the task positive mode. Give your mind a task if you find yourself um, stuck in autopilot. Google more about the default mode network. Yeah, so Mia, send me a, a DM with your email address. Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Stephanie. I too have had this brought up in my therapy. Perhaps you're talking about burnout or maybe you're talking about the um, default network and the deliberate intentional thoughts. Wendy says, I've done some counseling to heal my inner child find it difficult to really connect with myself. Any advice for this? Yeah, Wendy, I, my heart really goes out to you. This is, uh, this is uh, an ongoing issue. In a way, I relate to that. Um, you know, there's things that come up in our lives and we think, gosh, there's something here I really need to heal. We go back and sort of wonder where it comes from in the psychodrama of our childhood and doing self-compassion and imagery re-scripting work, which we talked about last Sunday. So if you missed that one, go back and watch our live stream from last weekend on imagery re-scripting. Very powerful way to do inner child work. And all I could say to you, I suppose, Wendy, is keep going. Just keep going. There's a wonderful book called Healing Developmental Trauma by Lawrence Heller. Healing Developmental Trauma, which I can recommend. And just keep going. Like this, this um, self-compassion work, this inner child work, it's lifelong. It's a lifelong project. My mother, um, bless her cotton socks, she's 74 and she still talks to me about insights, revelations and her own inner child work that she's doing. Um, you know, she was in therapy when I was in my adolescence, which is probably what inspired me to become a therapist. Um, let me see if there's any more comments here. Uh... Stephanie said, you're talking about pets. On Friday, my cat was having issues with breathing, heart, lungs. It made me feel like crap. Yeah, sorry to hear that. I was, what was I? Oh, yes, I was talking about the vagus nerve wrapping around the heart and lungs. 
Yeah, and you've got um, mirror neurons too, Stephanie. So, you know, when you see someone else uh, hurting, sometimes the same parts of your body can hurt. It's like when you, you know, see someone bang their head and you, we all sort of grab our head. You know, we, we kind of almost pick up each other's feelings like the Bluetooth of the brain. It's very interesting, isn't it? Um, so give yourself compassion. I, you know, as you probably all know, I'm very big on self-compassion. And there's many techniques. You can go to selfcompassion.org uh, if you're interested to dive into some of the work on self-compassion therapy. Well, I'm going to leave it there, I think, because we've been on for um, about half an hour. But I will post a link to um, the retreat, which Alexis and I are running in November, in case any of you are not yet signed up but able to come along if you're in southeast Queensland or can get here. Also, I'm giving some talks to doctors. If you know anyone in your life who's a doctor, let them know about my talks coming up at my Lutwich Clinic this um, Friday and Sunday and in November because um, I want to help GPs with their um, stress levels since the pandemic. I've met a lot of GPs who are chronically burnt out. So all of the information about upcoming events that I'm running is on the events page of the um, North Brisbane Psychologist website, which I've just shared in the in the links. All right. Well, I will um, thank you all for joining in today. I will love you and leave you and get my dinner out of the oven. Um, thank you again for watching and participating. And Alexis and I will see you again next weekend. We might actually be doing our live streams on Saturday mornings um, from now. I hope those of you who join in um, regularly can still do a Saturday morning. Make a comment below if Saturday mornings just won't suit you and I'll let Alexis know. But we're probably going to do about 7 a.m. on Saturday mornings. This Sunday evening time is a little tricky with my family at the moment. Um, but stay tuned to our Facebook page and we will let you know about that. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.